Good morning, St. Michael's community. We are glad you could join us this morning, and we invite you to say hello to your fellow parishioners in the chat box as we begin. In the Zoom chat, be sure to select to everyone and not just hosts and panelists so and everyone can see your comments. And you can access the service bulletin at the link I provide in the chat. A warm welcome to all of you, especially if you're visiting with us today. We're eager to greet you and learn how God is at work at your, in your life. So stay tuned. We'll say more about that later in the service. And if you're joining from home and you'd like to symbolically participate in the sacred meal of the Eucharist, find something simple to eat and drink and keep an eye on the chat for further instructions. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, take a breath and let yourself rest here in God's presence. Come, let us worship God together. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Bill Greville. Our scripture lesson is from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the, his height or statue, because I have rejected them, for the Lord does not see us as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither the Lord has chosen, neither has the Lord chosen me, has chosen this one. Then Jesse made Chama pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for he will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he, now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? and they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, 
so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him had heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, the question is, how do you know what you know? I mean, really, how do you know? There's a long study of this question in the world of philosophy over centuries, millennia. It's called epistemology investigating how it is that our opinion can become justified belief, in the words of the Oxford Dictionary. We arrive at what we know, not just what we think, through several different routes. We figure something out maybe by logical reasoning. We think it through, it makes sense, so we know it's true. Or we might know something through intuition, the kind of felt sense that's at a maybe deeper level than reason. We pick up cues about how somebody is doing before they've told us. We know things because we've experienced them, because they've happened to us, we've seen them. We know things because somebody else told us about them and we believe what they've said. And some philosophers allow we might know something because of divine revelation, the knowing that comes somehow from beyond our own faculties. But of course, every kind of knowing involves the possibility that we might be wrong or that our subjective experience, that is, who we are, the experiences we've had, how we're feeling that day, is shaping our knowledge. And that certainly comes up when it comes to matters of faith, questions about God and how God works in the world. It's one thing to say that we know the pew is hard, or the train is late, or that a friend seems sad. It's another to say with certainty that we know God is present here and now. That kind of knowing. Well, how do you know? Well, one thing I know is that this is the Lent of long gospel readings, as <laughs> our deacons will tell you. You stand for a long time, they read for a long time, they're great stories, but they are long ones from the Gospel of John. They're each focused on one compelling character, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the woman at the well, Lazarus, the beloved friend that Jesus raises from the dead, and today, this man born blind, and all the confusion that follows after Jesus heals him and brings him sight. These are stories that are rich with symbolism, nighttime darkness, the bright light of day, water, thirst, seeing, not seeing, death, and life. 
But they're also stories with characters that are wonderfully vivid and real and knowable. And I've always had a particular soft spot for the man in today's gospel. Now, there are, of course, a lot of stories in the gospels about people who are healed, who receive their sight from Jesus. And there's a lot of rejoicing and delight when that happens. But in this one, Jesus sees the man. He doesn't come and ask for any help. And in response to his disciples' question about sin, Jesus heals this man. And then most of the story goes on from there, spending its time on the fairly negative reaction that everybody has to this miraculous healing. And through it all, the man stays consistent. He just keeps repeating his story over and over and finally starts working in some pretty great zingers along the way. He healed me. This is how he did it. I was blind, but now I see. How do I know if this guy is a sinner? All I know is that he healed me. This is how he did it. You want the story again? You also want to be his disciples? And for all his pains, the leaders and the Pharisees throw him out. Too much truth-telling can be unpopular. One commentator pointed out that this man follows a trajectory that's exactly like the one that Jesus does in the Gospel of John in particular. His identity is questioned, even though he tells them directly, I am, I am the man, says the man born blind. Jesus says so many I am statements in the Gospel of John. He speaks frankly and logically, asserting the facts. This happened, this is how it worked. But nobody believes him. He resorts to sarcasm and truth-telling to put the Pharisees in their place, as Jesus does, only to be cast out completely from their community. And it's also the story of the early Christian community that created this gospel, as far as we can tell, who themselves were cast out from the mainstream community for their belief in Jesus. The, th the Pharisees, all the way through, are people who do not want to be troubled with the facts. None of what this man says, none of what Jesus says in the gospel is enough to persuade them. They simply can't see the truth. In the forum series that we've been doing this Lent, we've been exploring together what the Bible says about reparations, about the actions to redress wrongs done to those whose enslavement built this country. And it turns out there's a lot that the Bible says about this. Numerous passages in Hebrew and Christian scriptures that call us to make our repentance and reconciliation tangible and meaningful. Slavery is often assumed in the biblical worldview. It's part of the world those scriptures come out of. But so also is the need to make restitution for it in the community of God's people. And pair these scriptures with the facts of our American history, our economic history, the history of our churches, and it is not hard to make a moral, financial argument for why reparations need to happen. But this idea stays controversial in our society and in our churches to put it frankly, it's hard to embrace it. It's hard to give up money and status. And it's obvious that conveying the facts alone is not enough to convince anybody to take this uncomfortable step. So as we've been talking in our forum series, we've engaged that question of what turns hearts? It needs empathy in order to do that. It needs shared feeling. 
the sense that we are in this together. So the conversation changes from why should our group do something for your group to we have all suffered this. We all need this healing. Empathy, not the facts, leads to a different way of seeing that takes us from us, them, to us, we. And from there, from that seeing, we can begin to take action. Now this is just one of so many issues that we are dealing with in our world these days. We live in a time when facts fail to persuade, where facts are subject to opinion far more than the other way around. But we keep returning to facts, attempting to get others who disagree with us to see, as if we can argue them into seeing differently. And it never works. And if we do some honest self-evaluation, we also can see that we aren't always accepting all the facts. Just notice how the same set of facts about the COVID virus resulted in such a wide array of responses, even in the midst of our congregation. Our own worldview, whatever it is, our own assumptions about what is right, how things came to be, that also blinds us to what might be obvious to somebody else. We all struggle with knowing what we know and even more so with acting on it. We all struggle with truly seeing. That beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, that we'll get to sing later on in the service, quotes from this gospel story today. I once was blind, but now I see. John Newton, who wrote the hymn, the slave ship master, came to see and realize the great sin of the work that he was doing. But not all at once. He was converted to Christ after a shipwreck, but it took several years still for him to come to a place of realizing that his life's work was based on a terrible sin. And when he finally came to terms with that, when he finally saw fully, then he was able to make this repentance that took him not only from leaving that work, but to becoming an abolitionist, fighting to ban the trade that he had profited from before. Something helped him truly see, and then to truly change his ways. It wasn't that the facts had changed. It was that somewhere in there, he came to understand it differently. And somewhere in there, he had to make a choice. It couldn't have been easy, and yet it saved him. And the hymn that he wrote out of that has saved so many of us. The man who is healed in the gospel story is healed by Jesus, made to see by the pure action of God's grace in his life. That's at the very beginning. Jesus helps his eyes to see. But he comes more truly to see as he starts to engage with this miracle telling his story over and over again and living into it even in the face of opposition in his community. And by the time he gets to the end of the story when Jesus finds him again, then he really sees clearly who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of Man. What truly changes him is the healing that he lives into and he sees and believes Jesus when no one else does because he has a full experience of God in his life. 
His life has been changed, and he knows it. And he chooses to know it. He says to Jesus, tell me, sir, who the Messiah is, that I may believe in him. No facts told him by somebody else could have persuaded him to believe it. He knows God because he has felt God and because he has lived into what it means to feel God and because he chooses to continue to know and experience God in his life and to share that for the good of others. He goes from being a man born blind, a beggar, to being an apostle of Jesus's good news for the world. How do you know what you know? And what difference does it make? Because the thing, in, the thing is, in the life of faith, we are always asking ourselves that question. We experience God, and then we don't experience God. We see healing, and then we see suffering. We think sometimes how irrational faith is. And yet, we feel something deeper than rational at the same time. We hear the testimonies, we read the stories, and sometimes, maybe only once in a blue moon, we feel a little spark. Or maybe we live and breathe the presence of God in every waking moment of our lives. It's different for every one of us, and it's different for us in different stages of our lives, too. And yet somehow, we know what we know, or what we choose to know, or what we long to know. And we live according to that, by choice. Jesus sees us the way he sees that man. And he says, you have seen God. I am. God is. Love is. And so we can live with that. Amen. Amen. Please stand as together we sing our creed.
Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Carmel McCobry, and I'm here to lead you in the prayers of the people. In the silence after each prayer, you are invited to add your own prayers aloud, silently in your heart, or in the online chat box or comments. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Andrew, Alan, and Mary, our bishops, and Matt, our bishop-elect, for this gathering, for all ministers and people. We pray for our partner parish, St. Peter's in Eaton Square, London, and for our friends at St. Luke's Church and School in Motel, Haiti. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray for Denisha, Marley, and family, the Blackson and Ridgeway families, Paula, Kirby, Deborah, Annie Mae, James, Heidi, Caroline, Susan, James, and Edith. Pray for those in any need or trouble I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that all may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially the most reverend Frank Griswold, Francisco Jose Albano, Jeff Biles, Evelyn Ridgway, David Serrano. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may, may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all right unrighteousness. We pause now in quiet to offer to God our repentance for the ways we have fallen short, so that reconciled to God and to one another, we may freely approach this altar together to be fed. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen.
May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. their godly play experience, getting to explore together some stories about Jesus. I think today you guys heard stories of Jesus healing the blind, like we did. Also gathering children and summing up the whole law, love God, love each other, something like that, right? In each story you're reminding or you're discovering that Jesus loved with a very big heart. He loved loving and he wants us all to do the same. So, our prayer that as, as you come close to Jesus, your hearts grow and grow in love the way that Jesus loves you. And I bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as we all come together to gather around this table. Amen. Amen. So now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice for all.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice, for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
This is God's table, and all of us are invited guests. Wherever you are today on your journey, you are welcome to come and to receive. If you would like also to receive healing prayer, there will be healing prayer ministers positioned in the chapel of the angels to your right. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Please join me in our prayer after communion, the top of page 11 in your bulletin. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior, amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. A good, joyful thing to get to celebrate together here in this space with you today. A special welcome to you if you're joining us today for the first time in person, online. We are very, very glad to be joining you along the journey. If you are somebody that wants a little more information about things that are coming up or what's happening here at St. Michael's, I direct you to the back of the bulletin. The QR codes there can take you to information about um, what's coming. We are in the beginning, the fourth week of Lent, and so this season is sort of coming down towards the um, wonderful week of Holy Week and that leading into Easter. So there is still much to do in terms of our own preparation and time. I encourage you and invite you to the Lenten disciplines we have going on here. The forum that I referenced in the sermon, that takes place after the service starting at 1145 in the reception room or on Zoom. So you can join us either way. Reception room, if you're here in the space, goes to uh, go to that building next door to you and you'll find your way there. If you missed the first ones, that's fine. Come and join us today. And then Wednesday nights at 8.30, we start Alexio Divina, which means simply a prayerful reading together of scripture just for half an hour online as a way to kind of mark the midpoint of the week. So I encourage you towards both of those. Yesterday, about 10 of us went up to the Church of Good Samaritan in the Bronx and took part in the Haiti uh, Project food packing, which is a way to get meals to the kids and families that are part of the community there that we help support. Um, some of us, we left around two and they were already at 35,000 meals. They were on target to hit 50,000 by the end of the day. So an exciting, tangible way to be of service to the people that we pray for every week, the people of St. Luke's Church and School in Martel, Haiti. So this food is being shipped in as direct a way as possible to be sure that it gets to the people that need it. So pray for that, that the food gets to them, and continue to pray for that community that we are connected to there in Haiti. On the information that's coming, Women Alert, the Women's Retreat, is coming, and it's sooner than you think. It's the very beginning of May. Women of all ages, it's a great chance to come and get to know one another, to make community, to be friends and fellows along the path together. This year, the Reverend Julia Hoplomazian is going to lead us in what it looks like to have an embodied faith, so not just to talk about it with our heads or think about it spiritually, but to live it in our actual bodies. So come and be part of that. There's info in the bulletin about that as well. Two announcements, pastoral. One is um, we've set a date for the service for the celebration of life for Jeff Biles, husband of Denisha Williams, dad of Marley. And we'll be celebrating him on Friday, March 31st at 4 o'clock here in the church. It'll also be streamed, so I invite you to that. And then we have a new staff person that we got a chance to say something about online, but she's here in person. So Rachel Ludwig is sitting in the very back. Stand up, Rachel. She's our new communications coordinator. So welcome, Rachel. We're so excited you are here. Um, Damon Hancock, who's been filling that role, is scaling back to just filling the role he's doing right now, which is live streaming our ministry um, on Sundays. Um, and Rachel is going to be picking up all the pieces of how we talk to ourselves and the world, um, so helping us do that better. So we'll see what that goes. So let's stand for our final prayer together. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who kneel before you, and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Let us bless the Lord. 